well, the atmosphere itself was was amazing because I think um, the Argentinian fans probably expected their team to be in San Etienne and had taken a huge uh, sections of the ground. Uh, our fans had expected us to win our group, so we're a little bit, um, you know, fewer supporters than, than we might have uh, normally had at the game. And yet, as always, England fans managed to filter their way in and, and find tickets from somewhere. So I think San Etienne only holds about 38,000, but the atmosphere was incredible. Nice, balmy evening. It's one of those nights that the best football games seem to be played on. You, your memories of the best games are always the sun shining or, the, or there's a warmth to the evening. Um, and then to, to go through the roller coaster of goals in the first period, um, you know, in, including Michael's, um, you know, runs that, that win us the penalty, and then and then his run that uh, you're thinking he's through on goal, and then all of a sudden Roberto Ayala's about 20 yards behind the rest of the defence, and you think, what's he doing there? And and then of course Michael just goes past him as well, so you you you're almost aware at that moment that that was a goal that that had launched a career on a world stage even though you're in the middle of the game you're thinking wow that is something that at Michael's age is is going to go all around the world and and be defining for him so uh, and then I remember sitting on the bench and Peter Taylor who was one of the coaches with us um, looking at Argentina set up for the free kick and trying to get a message on because he'd seen them carry out a routine uh, uh, the, the routine that they carried out um, and brilliantly executed free kick that uh, uh, that meant that we, we go in at 2-2 two -two and, and the whole game's up for grabs again. Tell us what happened in that dressing room at half-time, 2-2. Two -two. You know, more's happened in a half than happens in three games normally. What did Glenn say at half-time? Oh, I mean, difficult to remember the, the exact details, but... Um, Glenn always had belief in us as a team and I think there was a case of him being conscious that we'd just conceded and often that can have a big impact as you as you come in for half time so um, I think he was accentuating the fact that you know we'd played well um, we'd shown we were capable of scoring goals against Argentina we needed to just be tight defensively um, and that we'd proved to ourselves that we were capable of winning the game um, and um, yeah, I also think around that period, you know, he'd always talked to us about discipline and and you know making sure that um, we kept eleven men on the field and the importance of those things. Whether that was mentioned at half time is difficult to remember, but uh, you know, I remember when David was sent off, thinking, mm, you know, that is something we have talked about as a group and. Um, you knew that it was going to be a backs to the wall job now with the quality that Argentina had. Massive uh, turning point in the game, the, the sending off. What, did you see it actually happen? Can you remember the moment seeing him on the floor? Were you watching? Yeah, I, I mean, on the bench, um, we're, we're watching the, the, the um, incident unfold and actually partly thinking, oh, you know, there's there's a bit of a reaction, but not convinced that that's going to draw a red card and, and probably in the English league w wouldn't have been a red card um, uh, and of course Simeone does his best to make it a red card <laughs> um, so uh, yeah and then almost the, the kind of shock and uh, wondering what, what's next now for us as a team because um, um, we've, we've lost a, a good player but also you know that the odds and the statistics tell you that going down to 10 men um, historically in, in big matches means very rare that you improve your result. You might hang on to, to a, a lead if you've got it, um, but to, to come from behind in a game or to, to win a game that you're drawing statistically is very low um, in, in, in big matches. Do you remember your personal emotional responses? I mean, this is your first World Cup. That one incident, as you say, is likely to result in it ending there. Do you remember how you felt? But no, really, I, I, I think at the time we felt a bit of an injustice that the decision's given as a red card. Um, 
and then you're waiting to see, okay, what are we going to do now tactically? What's what's Glenn going to go with? Um, and you know, after a fairly short period, he decided he was going to go to a back four. Um, so now I'm thrown back into the into the game, having missed a couple of matches, and now I'm starting to think, is my ankle actually as strong as I think it might have been? Um, and uh, but brilliant to be then in the midst of this game. You're coming on. 70 minutes, we're backs to the wall. Actually, it's you know for a defender is quite a nice scenario to be in. Um, you, you're thinking it's it's a time to really stand up for your country, and um, uh, was was brilliant just to be back involved in the World Cup at that moment. So going into the details, does Glenn come over to you and say, "This is what I want to do. I'm going to go for your in." Does he? Is it literally like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, we we had always played a a back three. Um, on that night, Gary Neville was on the right of the three, Tony Adams in the middle, Sol Campbell on the left, um, and Graham Lasso at left wing back, and he took Graham off, moved Sol across to left uh, left back, and put me in into the centre of defence with Tony. So um, it was something we'd, you know, we'd played together as a centre back partnership before. Um, it was a bit different to, to the way we'd played. Um, but when you're down to ten men, then then you know sacrificing the extra defender is is probably a logical way to go, really. Sol Campbell scored what many of us watching thought was a the winner. Mm. Can you remember the moment? Did you think it was a goal? I thought it was a goal. Um, I was one of the few people to realise it wasn't a goal, and then. All of a sudden, there were about eight Argentinians running at us with the ball, and half of our team were off the pitch celebrating still. So, there's this bizarre scenario where I, th I think there's two or three of us trying to delay an attack, um, and which we managed to to see off. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, some of the guys obviously had those few moments of thinking, you know, we're through, and. Uh, the rest of us are immediately thinking, no, no, we're not in trouble. So it was, uh, yeah, very strange sort of five to, to 15 seconds, really. Um, and amazing that uh, the referee allowed the, the play to go as quickly as he did, um, with it having been such a controversial decision. How do you, how, how do you recall the rest of extra time playing out? Yeah, I, I just remember there being a lot of defending to do. Um, uh, I said earlier that the likes of Ortega and Batistuta are top, top players and Veron. So you knew that Argentina had players that could, could open you up and uh, cause you real problems. And uh, as a defender with, uh, with 11, that's, that, that's tough. Um, with 10, we showed incredible resilience and we kept, you know, Glenn tried to keep an attacking threat on the pitch as well. Um, and of course, all the while, having been through what we'd been through in '96 with the penalty shootout as well, you're then at the back of your mind. You know, we don't really want to go through that again as a team. So you're hoping to get the the late goal, but also conscious that to get to penalties, actually, when we're down to ten, is probably the best we can hope for. I mean, you you, you obviously have, you know have your own penalty history. Did you feel that the players? Um, had it at this point in '98 already become a significant psychological issue for England players? Penalty shootouts. Did we know? Had we had? Uh, a, had we had enough of them by then to have it build up as a problem? No, yeah, I, I don't think. Um, I don't. I don't think it was a case of getting to that point and not believing it was possible. Um, you know, we'd had the experience in '90, but in '96 we'd won one shootout and we'd lost one. So. And the regular five takers um, in '96 had, had scored all five. So um, I don't think, as a team, that was necessarily the mindset. I think the difficulty was that you know some of the guys that would have taken penalties were no longer on the pitch in '98, um, and so you're back to players that wouldn't normally be in that situation um, taking penalties where they don't take them for their clubs, and that's that's always a more, a more difficult scenario for players. As Glenn got you all together ahead of the penalty shootout, and as you say, a number of the players that would have taken them were no longer there. 
How did he go about the process of, was it volunteers? Did he select? How did that happen? Yeah, I, I, I can't actually remember the exact process that night. Um, I knew he had me pretty, pretty, quite a long way down the line of takers. Um, but um, yeah, I also, I don't know, you'd have to speak to Paul, but I, I, I know Paul unfairly got stick for not taking a penalty in 1996 and people said he should have done but you know I didn't I never believed that to be the case really and whether he felt he needed to step forward um, would be would be interesting to talk to him about um, you know as a more senior player he probably felt that, that that depth of responsibility but again he's not a player that takes penalties regularly nor is David Batty so um, both of them either felt they were best placed or were asked to take them and um, given we only had sort of five attacking players on the field at the time they were probably as uh, as adept at taking them as anybody else really did you did you feel a personal empathy for the two boys after the after they'd missed did you talk to them after the game yeah I mean very difficult because both of them are very proud characters and um, you know I knew where I was um, at that moment in 1996, so um, you know that you've got empathy with them, but also you know that you don't necessarily want sympathy at that time. It's a difficult place to be, and uh, you have got to deal with that to a degree on your own. And everybody is different in how they want to respond to it. But those two guys are pretty tough and strong characters and um, you, you feel you should say something but you know you also know that um, uh, that whatever you say isn't really registering I don't think What was the mood like in the dressing room at the end? Ah, one of enormous disappointment um, we, we knew that we had a team going into the tournament that had a really good chance of, of you know, winning a World Cup um, and I think we, we all genuinely believed that. Um, I, I guess at that time, if we'd played somebody like Brazil, as in playing Argentina, there was a bit more of the unknown with playing some of the South American teams. A lot more of those players now play in the English leagues or play in Europe. Um, at that time, you know, some of those guys were playing in Spain and Italy, but I don't remember any of them being involved in... Uh, in games in England so there was that little bit of an unknown of how how you would go against the top South American teams um, which maybe doesn't exist in quite the same way now um, but we certainly had belief from from what we'd done over the previous two years so to go out on penalties to go out having gone down to 10 men we felt we'd given a, a good account of ourselves but we hadn't achieved what we wanted to achieve and you know that in your life you only get one or two opportunities to represent your country in a major tournament. How was how was David Beckham afterwards? Did he did he talk to the team? Did he apologise? Ah, oh, David was distraught. Um, you know, David had a, a very good friendship with Terry Byrne, who was one of our masseurs, and um, you know their their friendship went to, onto another level after that night. I think T Terry ended up representing David um, later in his career. Um, and I know spent a lot of time with him, but it, again, difficult scenario really, because I think although the sending off, you know, people were conscious of it, so much else had happened through the events of the game that I don't think any of the players in the dressing room really r recognised or expected the sort of reaction that David got when he when he came back and. Um, um, I don't think any of us would have viewed it in, in the same way as the public or sections of the public and the media did at that time. The reaction was, was incredible, you know, there was effigies on the him and all that kind of thing. He, he showed quite a lot of character, didn't he, to, to, to bounce back from that, but 1999 mm. he made the trouble with United. And did, we were aware that he went through a very tough time at that period. Yeah, uh, you're conscious of it because you're you're watching um, from afar but you're not really uh, I mean I guess if anybody can relate to what he went through it would be me having been through the experience I went in 1996 um, I don't think 
the reaction I had was quite as vitriolic. Um, although that was probably from a you know a small section of supporters. Um, but to come through anything like that in your life, those setbacks where the whole country are watching and uh, have a view is is a very difficult challenge for anybody. So for him to come back and to have the career he had with England um, and to be able to bury some of those demons in in, in matches and tournaments um, that were ahead of him was a uh, testimony to his strength of character and his, um, uh, his mental toughness and resilience. There is a sort of feeling, Gareth, that the 1998 game against Argentina is England's last great heroic World Cup game. Do you, do you see it that way? Yeah, I, I guess. Um, I guess the, the the way the game unfolded and the um, the na the narrative that that game took on um, was different to the way that we went out in two thousand and two and two thousand and six. Um, you know, the irony is that we got to the quarter final in those two tournaments and. Um, 06 in particular was a, another very dramatic game with, with penalty shootout as well. Um, but I, I think it's the nature of the game, the nature of that match. Um, and because, um, yeah, because we probably had a team that people really believed could win it um, and, were, and had played in a way that we'd probably, you know, you know people felt even with 10 men, we'd really played at, at a very high level so uh, you know I think if we looked back at 2006 that that was also a, a team that played very well and um, had some outstanding players and and you know people probably believed had a chance of winning again um, but yeah I guess there was something about the game in Sanetti and that just sticks in people's minds that that bit more. Just finally on that tournament um, as I mentioned before, Varon says you know it was possibly the greatest game you ever played in. I know you didn't play in the whole game, but where does it rank for you? Yeah, I, I think um, yeah, in terms of drama, um, would, would be you know incredibly high. Um, for me, on a personal level, with England, our game with Holland in 1996 at Wembley would be would be the pinnacle. Um, which is a shame because you hope that the pinnacle is going to be a, a winning a final. Um, but in terms of a game where we played at a really high level and it was a game that everybody can remember, it's the game with Holland is still the one that people, when I meet them on the streets, talk about. And uh, it's another game where the crowd was 90,000, but 250,000 people seem to have been there. <laughs> the area outside the ground in San Etienne, um was both coaches pull up together and there's an area where we were able to to meet our families briefly um, who had flown out for the game and were traveling back separately we had to fly back to our base camp um, before flying back to England so we had some time with our families just to, to talk through what had happened and try and take everything in uh, which is impossible really but um, there's no bar or lounge area for people to meet at that point. Um, and then all of a sudden we're conscious of the Argentinian coach pulling away and rather than humbly <laughs> um, taking the win, you know, they're all dancing on the bus and the, most of them have got their t-shirts off and they're swinging them around their heads and um, yeah, it's a memory that will stay with me, with me forever and I think everybody that was there um, and was certainly something that when we played them again in Japan in 2002, those of us that had been involved in 98 would have been fairly certain to mention it to those that weren't there. Um, you know, you never, revenge is never enough to win a game of football and um, um, there's so much needed to win games and you've got to have a very clear head. So, um, but anybody that says that victories after events like that aren't that little bit sweeter uh, is lying. <laughs> Do you think the Argentinians were out of order? Oh, I think uh, I think it's every individual's decision how they respond when they win or they lose and um, 
it's difficult in those moments of exhilaration and who knows you know the narrative that their players have been through leading into that game and what what's been expected of them and um their view of England uh, uh, as a country having you know been through the the war with us as well um you never like to involve politics and wars with sport but you know in those in, at those periods of time um that was re they were realistic memories and more recent memories for people that uh, probably had a bigger impact than they would now. If we'd have won, do you think we'd have celebrated it in the same or in a different way? <sighs> yeah, good question. I, I don't think the team we had at that time would have celebrated in that way. Um, but equally, it, it, it's easy to say, in, you know, in the calmness... <laughs> Uh, decades on uh, how you would have reacted I think in those moments it's difficult to predict how you're going to react really in, in the moments of joy and elation and tension and undercurrent of everything that, that goes into um, a big international match